I'm not the expert on lighting. Who is? <laughs> Who that? Is that called tough guitar? Tough guitar. It's really trombone heavy to be a tough. Well, guitar you know, I'll track. tell you what it is. Is it's awesome because it has all the uh, the trappings of like a late '60s spaghetti western. Yeah, something really magnificent is about to happen at the end of that soundtrack. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, hey, first of all, I want to thank you guys for joining us. I'm Brad with Main Stage Music. Flanked with me, as always, is Jamie Blanton. Ex- Blanked. Gu- guitar extraordinaire. Strategically located. And I'll tell you what, you guys picked an awesome uh, evening, because a very special evening, okay? Because normally we do this on Tuesdays, right? Yeah. But it's a special night. Didn't they do this like on... Uh, network tv like it was a big deal when like full house was on a different night or something like that well you were just telling me everyone getting queued up for thanksgiving christmas halloween that Mm -hmm. like mondays and the dread of like in-law engagement was just ramping up in your customer base so you decided to do a twist on monday as opposed to tuesday you gotta do a twist well it give you something to look forward to after a, a terribly sunny and pleasant monday uh, here in uh, East Tennessee. But yeah. anyways, we've got a very special show planned for you guys for this special day. Uh, we are talking about pickups. And not just any pickups. We're talking about the greatest pickups out there. Seymour Duncan uh, pickups. And I'll tell you what, we've got a very special guest with us. All the way from, I guess, is it like Santa Barbara, California? Um, my Great. friend... Um, Adi Tejada with Seymour Duncan is actually joining us from the Seymour Duncan studios. And um, so how cool is this? We've got for you guys here in East Tennessee, a real live California Seymour Duncan guy who with a little bulldog too, which is super cool. Okay. For all you Georgia fans. Um, And, uh, but we're going to be talking about the uh, history of Seymour Duncan, what makes them better um and honestly uh i thought Audie could probably chime in on some pretty cool secret sauce kind of stuff but um and direct line through the comments to have a conversation with one of the most epic uh pedal slash accessory builders oh yeah absolutely because we welcome your comments of course always they read live on the air and uh, additionally you can share this with your friends who you think might dig it you can follow us on well, of course, you must follow us on Facebook already, right? Um, or also on YouTube if you're not doing that already. That way you get live updates and so on and so forth. But um, moving right along. So Seymour Duncan. You know, I had to do a little bit of a digging, okay? Now, of course, um, I've actually met Seymour Duncan once. Yeah? Yep. Um, we met at a NAM show. Of course, for all y'all, uh, the NAM show is the National Association of Musical Merchandisers. So it's the music store trade show. And so... Um, Every, uh, well, twice a year under normal non-pandemic circumstances, um, all the manufacturers will go to NAM to show off their goods, so to speak. And uh, every once in a while, Seymour would make an appearance. And um, anyways, cool cat, though. Cool yeah, cat. Man. And he's actually uh, not a California native. He's from New Jersey. So is that, is that, there, there you go. Is that better or worse? Well, so I had to do a little digging because here I thought, thought I got this, you know, vision of him, you know, kind of this long hair beach bum kind of guy, you know, hanging out in the valley with like Crosby, Stills and Nash and all this kind of stuff. But I did a little digging and found out that the roots now, again, Adi, feel free to chime in if I'm if I say something that's uh, incorrect, yeah, obviously. Sure. But um, so he grew up in New Jersey played uh we'll just say fender style guitars Mm. all right yeah and um anyways a buddy of his the pickup went out on one of his guitars and he's like and this is back in the day when kids didn't just you know complain about things that (laughs) broke on their uh profile social media profile they actually tore it apart and let me see if i can mess around with it and he basically figured out that well wait a minute this is just a piece of wire wrapped around a magnet a bunch of times you know what, I figured I'm going to put this bobbin, this pickup bobbin, on my record player 
and then I'm just going to sit yep. there and spin some uh, some copper wire on this thing and see if I can fix it. Oh, and, wow. And when he did, the pickup sounded like way better <laughs> than when they, you know, when it was working. And his friend's like, dude, dude. And, it, and just like that serendipity happened. And he goes, man, I'm going to, I want to learn about this. So from then he started hanging out and uh, moved to California. Okay. And then he started hanging out with guys like um, Les Paul and uh, um, people like that, okay, who were also tinkerers and musicians as well. Yeah. And, um, and the, they Jeff said... Uh, and Hendrix and all those guys. Well, yeah, I read that he didn't get to meet Hendrix until he kind of, kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know? He basically, you know, they said, California is a place you ought to be... Well, how is Seymour Duncan meeting Jimi Hendrix like the Beverly because, Hillbillies? Because Uncle Jed, <laughs> sure. Uncle Jed was shooting for some food, yep. and up through the ground came a bubbling crude, okay? Right. But see, Seymour, he was, you know, figuratively hunting for his skill set as a, a pickup guy, and they said, you know, you need to go to England, Jolly old London is where all the, all the cool stuff is happening. Okay, so he packed up his bags, which you got to do when you're young, because when you're an old, broken, middle-aged guy like like me, you can't exactly just up and move to England. All of okay? his friends said that's definitely all, a young person's move. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> just, yeah, sure, I'll go. Yeah. All, so, all his friends said, "Hey, Seymour, you should move away." Including from here. Uh, according to the you know the accounts. Uh, Les Paul actually said, dude, it's happening over there right now. In Britain, stuff is happening. But that is the Beverly Hillbillies lyric, right? What? Hey, old Jed, move away from here. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, Seymour, move he's away a, from here. You a, know? Uh, don't, ever, don't ever bring up Beverly Hill. You're just terrible jokes. But anyway. This isn't a good context for me. I'm, <laughs> so, out of, I'm out of my humor base. So, long story short, he moves to London, jolly old London, England, to work for a Southern California company. So, irony, anybody? You know, so he moves from California yeah. to, to work for a company based out of California, yeah. which was Fender. They effectively had set up an office in London. Um, and so he worked in the repair and the research and development for Fender, uh, their place in London. And guess what happened in the 1960s in London? He got to... Meet, meet and hang out yeah. with Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, psychedelic rockers, and Jeff Beck, who who said it was always his favorite guitar player. Jeff, I mean, well, what's not to love, right? And and in doing that, Jeff Beck's probably my favorite of that bunch too. I mean, they're that's a pretty strong bunch right there. Oh, Pete Townsend. So he starts, you know, messing around with pickups, and he turns into the pickup guy. Hmm. So these guys are like. Man, I don't know. This guitar sounds a little weak. Take it down to that uh, Seymour guy in uh, at the Fender R and D thing, and he'll wind you up a set. And I don't know, but I think that the 1954 Les Paul that Jeff Beck played and is pictured on the Blow by Blow album. Okay, the 54 Les Paul was supposed to have P90s. This one had full size humbuckers. Conversion. And I would, I would say there's a very strong chance that those pickups were wound by Seymour Duncan for Jeff Beck. It's it's likely. I can't confirm that though. I'm not. No, I don't know that for sure. But you know what? Or would. It's yeah. likely that it was because yeah. I mean he was the guy, and these guys are already modifying their stuff, and so, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't want... I apologize for interrupting, but we're getting in our first comments. First, we have two comments from our longtime viewer, Freddie Fry. He says, New friggin' Jersey! I lent him my 65 Jaguar for years! He did... He also says, He did auto parts with my boss in Jersey. Is that what uh, guys from New Jersey sound like? They, yeah. That's a pretty... Yeah, I was going to say. I, I, any, you know... Okay, well. Anyway. And Ron and Ron Wallen has two comments as well. He says, "I'm tuning in a couple minutes late." Was Seymour Duncan his real name? And also, so he loaded up the truck and moved to uh dot 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 London dot 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 dot. Yeah, you don't have to there say the dots. The dots are implied silence. Um, 
Yeah, it's named. Seymour is his real name. As yeah. far as I, yeah. So I mean, that's. I him that's so now that being said, it's like uh, what I would really love to know, which again, is what did you really learn when it comes to the the spinning of the pickups? Because you'd think that if he goes there to London to hone his craft, that he's already kind of found a little local following. Did was it that he brought London or you know the Fender Company his skills, or did Fender have some skills that he was able to go? Oh, um, I mean that'd be kind of an interesting thing to know. Like, did was he taught more stuff from Fender, or did he go to Fender and say, "Yeah, you guys are doing this wrong"? Well, I imagine it was a little bit of both. I imagine that he. This is speculation on my part. I haven't talked to him about this oh, okay. uh, particularly, but I imagine it also just allowed him more resources to to tinker with things, yeah. you know, different different wire, different magnets, all that stuff that that his ear and could just hone in on the number of wines, all that the pickup voodoo, just to really oh, yeah. get all that down and right place, right time. Yeah, two options. Yeah, you know, so you just had the base you know, uh, discussion this past, past, uh, show and talked about the, the difficulty of like, it was really encouraged for local musicians in the UK to play UK made instruments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Fender influence was kind of the, maybe the taboo or the more interesting piece of gear to grab. Um, so that him being able to emulate that might've been a, a workaround to take other instruments and get them nearer to, what might have been considered a U.S. or a Californian sound. Well, it's but, also interesting that it's primarily humbuckers that he's, you know. Yeah, and that's that. That would be the next, uh, you know. That that's your homework lesson from from this little <laughs> East Tennessee show is, you know, how long was it? How long was you know Leo making you know twins and deluxes before, you know Mesa got them and added a gain stage and then that was all the rave. You know, Fender was made how many trillions of 50s and early 60s single coils, and he was making them hotter, and that was desirable. How long did it take the factory markets to catch up to the custom markets with something that was a a pretty easy? Mod yeah, but think to about do? there was no factory market for aftermarket pickups. No, what I'm saying is the factory production models would have been lower wind, lower gain. Oh, for like pickups. a cost-effective. Yeah, thing? and then and then the quick mod is you know overwinds or mm -hmm. changing some of the magnets, which that's is a fairly simple mod to do that the but, factories could yeah. have copied, but it took a really long time. Before which you know happened. I could imagine like from a factory standpoint. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, Adi, in this, in that a factory's yeah. job is just to. You know, you, you have different guitar designs, okay? And then you just keep pumping out the... And the pickups are almost an afterthought for a lot of these companies. So, like, with so, Fender, yeah. it's not like, you know, they go, oh, and here's our uh, Alnico 5 magnet pickup, and here's our ceramic magnet pickup. I mean, back in those days, here's our pickup. You know, this is yeah. what goes in the Strat, and this is what goes in the Tele, and a lot of them were the same pickup, just mm -hmm. different uh, plastic casing. And same with Gibson. They, they didn't have multiple pickups. You had one pickup in their guitar so you know pre-1957 it was the p90 i mean that was it even in the lap steels and stuff it was the same design and then once the humbucker was developed by seth lover then the humbucker was the professional thing that was in there so um so what seymour kind of you know innovated really is um well what what if you want a humbucker in a single coil guitar Willikers. Yeah. You know, who would have thought, you know? And, uh, or just overwound. Just overwound, underwound, different tone. Um, the the earliest stuff, they were just taking in orders for to rewind pickups. Mm -hmm. So, no, pickup and, well, you know, another thing. So he um, obviously was, so we're late 60s, but Seymour Duncan wasn't really uh, incorporated. I don't know if it was a, even incorporation. It might've been a sole proprietorship or what, but it wasn't started until what? 76. Was it, it was the mid late seventies. It was, it was, uh, 70. Yeah. 76. 76. Cause that, that's because this is our 45th anniversary. Oh, gotcha. Oh, well, how cool. So, yeah, Happy anniversary. Awesome. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we got also... yeah, and they started with a, a little a little sh- shop, little warehouse space, um, down down in, in Santa Barbara still, and eventually grew into bigger and bigger ones till we're at the the two buildings we're at now. So gotcha. Now, I, hey, we got a longtime viewer and a great customer, Robert Hazard. Who, again, I know you don't know these guys, Adi, but Robert is an Eddie Van Halen is freak accurate with him i would say i mean he's an absolute you know if it's eddie van halen he's he's all about it but um he wants to know did eddie have anything to do with the 78 custom and um now i'll tell you so that pickup has some lore around it so the the frankenstein is a evh pickup out of the custom shop the 78 is a pickup that it's not it's not EVH branded but it's to capture his tone and it's a replica of a pickup that was made for Eddie whether the use of that particular pickup is not really um, we don't really know exactly what, what he used that pickup on he did it wasn't in a guitar and he played it that pickup uh, not sure exactly what recordings live he used that for, but, but he it definitely a really, used really it. Popular pickup to to achieve that brown brown sound. So. Now I read also that the custom custom was designed in the mid '80s for Eddie. That I can't confirm that. I'm not really 100 percent sure on that. Because I know that the full shred was for the Night Swan, the Kramer Night Swan. Yeah. And so you guys had something with Kramer, which was the biggest guitar company in the world in the mid '80s, and yeah. obviously used Duncan pickups. And then, um, of course, Eddie was a Kramer endorsee or whatever. So I read again: this is internet stuff or hearsay or whatever. But that the full shred was for the Night Swan, and the custom custom was for Eddie's uh, Pacers or whatever he was playing at the time. Um, it's it's really likely. I I'm just not sure. I, I've been with the company a little more than two years, so mm-hmm. been a still fan learning, for yeah. a long time. So yeah. I don't, I don't know that that going back. So tell me far. a little bit, you know, and again, two years. What a rough two years. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good, I mean, good timing. It's like you come in there, and then it's like a sickness, pestilence, <laughs> you know. But yeah, um, I got to go to one Nam, and then it. Ah, <laughs> oh, like, bummer. <laughs> well, you know, one thing. It's like uh, I'm sure a lot of the viewers would like to know too. But what's it like working at Seymour Duncan? I mean, um, I mean, I know it's a factory, but I mean, there's some factories that are hot and nasty and yuck, and then there's like a candy cane factory, which isn't right. <laughs> And so I would assume that Seymour Duncan's got to be somewhere kind of in the middle um, of like a nasty uh, factory and then something that's just like perfect. So Our factory is really dialed. It is, um, it's really well organized. It's as clean as you could, it could be, um, you know, given that there's a lot of materials coming in and out of here. So it, it's, really well organized clean there's there's lines that we have um three or four lines that just make humbuckers Mm -hmm. and then uh one or two that make single coils kind of depending and we have active lines and we have a whole pedal section and our factory's really expanded uh in the last uh 18 months so we've taken all the floor space that we can and turned it into more production and moved actually our whole shipping department and our accounting and stuff either into another building or remote. So that's smart. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. So our, yeah, I'm really proud of our production team and just having a, a really nice looking clean floor. Uh, they get there's <laughs> the first couple of days I work here, I'm sitting at my desk in the morning and all of a sudden they just start blasting music and I get up because uh, my office is in the upstairs and there's a little balcony to look down onto the production floor. And I look over and everyone is up dancing. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> it's they're sitting there and they're doing stuff. So twice a day, they just start playing music and I'll be on the phone sometimes to the dealer. And all of a sudden <laughs> the music will come in. <laughs> well, that's a good question. And Ron just chimed yeah. in. He goes, how many of your employees are musicians? Um, a good amount. So. 
I don't really have an exact number on it. The the everyone in the sales department plays a mm-hmm. little bit, um, and in the marketing department, it seems like everyone plays is in bands. Some people are in bands, so there's a good amount that that uh, are musicians. There's like a couple people like our CFO isn't. But his daughter plays and oh. just appreciators. So. Yeah, I know Brad yeah. didn't say that at the beginning of the meeting, but you're certainly you're certainly fine to lie. Nobody will know. <laughs> you, you can say there's ninety seven point yeah, three two percent. Yeah, it's a good amount. It is a good amount. No, I'm picturing the Seymour factory. It's like uh, all the all the invaders are made by like goth kids. Everybody's in trench coats and black nails. <laughs> black nails. Yeah. All of the little antiquity yeah. jazz masters are like beautiful people in these flowy white garments and then <laughs> nobody's wearing shoes and they're just sort of dancing around making these very careful delicate pickups once you get old and withered we put you to making antiquities yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> now i'll tell you so we you know we were we we're talking about um you know the range and the style so like you know seymour went to london worked in research and development and the first handful of pickups that he made you know obviously are still really really good sellers uh, like for example, the '59, which is just a yeah. um, the version of the classic PAF, you know, humbucker, and then the um, SH24. Those are the the Jeff Beck set, you know, the Jazz and the JB. Um, yeah. And um, but you know, you know those pickups, which by the way are are still some of our best sellers. Okay, are, are yeah. great, are fantastic pickups, but. Um, what is y'all's research and development um, like? Because you got some. I brought some with me, by the way. You guys have some really unique pickups that um, perhaps our customers don't even know about. But it's just kind of neat to think. Like, um, do you have somebody who just sits there tapping a pencil on his chin and goes, "Maybe we could take this and this and just." Um, I mean, is it like a bunch of engineers that you know sit around and come up with this stuff, or? It's a mixture. So we, Kevin Beller, the uh, who's our head engineer, he's been with the company I want to say for forty years, something really long like that. Wow. Yeah, he's been since the. I think it's. I think he started in 1980, 81. So wow. yeah, right around forty years. Yeah. So he comes up, came up with like a lot of those ideas, like the blackouts and the duck bucker things like that. Um, a lot of it is artist collaboration too. So we have um, like the Jupiter here. This is with Wes Hawk. It's he's like a metal player. It's a oh, new cool. rail pickup. We haven't gotten those with. yet. Yeah. So this is so this is him going back and forth with a product development guy, um, literally sending DIs of the pickup and back, back and you know reamping or whatever they're doing to really dial in what is he wants for his response stuff like that um other ones that might have been something that was in a custom shop at one point mm-hmm. the the uh ssl5 that was a pickup that uh seymour had wound for uh gilmore for oh gilmore. cool i didn't and, know that and it, it's just an overwound ssl1 for the he had that in his bridge position and it, it originally was called like an ssl1 c so it had a different name just a custom shop pickup, and then it graduated from the custom shop into our line, and that's how this the SSL five. Now that's so really there's cool. There's a few different ways it could, it could go about. So yeah. now, do you guys? Um, you have a custom shop now. Um, I know that the stuff that you know that I know about the custom shop is like the antiquities would be considered like a custom shop type of product, right? Yeah, yeah. And those then, are made in the custom shop. Now, but let's say you had some customer that dreamed up some sort of. Uh, concoction i mean do you actually do custom stuff like hey i want to yeah, you know <laughs> if somebody wanted yeah yeah we'll, we'll do kind of whatever we can so sure if you wanted mismatched bobbins something like that and some or look uh, if a guy said i got a jimmy aesthetic, reed can, thin twin and you. <laughs> you know i wanted a replacement <laughs> pickup for a, a jimmy reed thin twin you know i want, I want a firebird there, yeah, there and are a p90 some stuff that require that stuff that's uh, special tooling if we don't have a part if we have to actually fabricate a part we're not really doing that okay. right now just because of the the pure workload of production oh yeah absolutely um, yeah and then i mean something like the the black winner because my so this is the black winner so 
this was just they were at Nam shooting the shit with some um, Scandinavian dealers and I like, came up with an idea to have the most evil dark sounding pickup <laughs> and and they just they like they, they just uh, I, I think this was originally only made um, like exclusive for Scandinavia or something for a little oh, wow. while and that that was years and years ago and then it's now one of our most popular pickups the Black Winter so there's other ideas that kind of come back and forth like that and and Derek Duncan who is Seymour's son his youngest son he he's really involved with the custom he runs the custom shop now oh, cool and so yeah he ha- he helped come up with the design of this so, so following yeah. in his father's footsteps that's really cool for sure for learning sure. the family yeah. business so. <laughs> yeah we got some yeah. new comments coming in Ron Wallen has pitched in again how many of the employees are musicians he already answered that one oh, okay uh, oh, so yeah, we we have over a hundred employees now, well over. Mm-hmm. I would probably say thirty percent to fifty percent. I'm talking a lot of the production. Sure. A lot of the person, it's the production workers aren't. There, there is a um, probably a lower percentage of production workers that are musicians because some of them that that's just it's a just job, a job. Right? No, I get it. Yeah. yeah, some of them are so. And there's, um, since I work mainly from home, when I do come into the office like today, I'm, I'm walking around production. There's so many new faces that I see. So, yeah. That's cool. I'll That's see cool. some kids wearing some some band t-shirts and stuff, though, that I I've, I've not, haven't met yet. <laughs> well, you know, Ron also <laughs> chimed in. He goes, Gilmore is one of the greatest, arguably most underappreciated musicians of all time. I had to get oh, yeah. that in there. I know that this isn't the topic, <laughs> but he just spreading some Gilmore love. Uh, under Underappreciated? Uh, I think he just loves Gilmore so much uh, that he has to toss no, that in no there. No amount you know? of appreciation will ever be it's like, enough. like, Mike Tyson's one of the most underappreciated boxers of all time. It's like, uh... Well, he know? is one of the most underappreciated cartoon uh, vocal artists of all well, time. Well, there you go. So, And then uh, uh, Greg Sluter chimed in. He goes, he'd like a mini humbucker. Well, Greg, I'll put one on my next order. Unless That's not one of the ones that is like uh, temporarily shuttered, is it? The mini humbucker. Uh, the some of those are so we're, we're and I'm going off memory. I I know we're doing the vintage mini humbucker still. Okay. And the antiquities. I, there is the custom mini humbucker and the seamerized. Those are both on the the temporary suspended list. Gotcha. Now for for y'all if who I don't, have, if I have inventory, I'll send it to you. Oh just yeah. To, I can't put it on an order and back order it. But. So just a quick thing for viewers. Um, we are living in an, a, a, a tragic but also a very amazing time. It's tragic, obviously, because all the sickness that's going around. But what's amazing is, is there has just been this explosion of creativity and people picking up the guitar again. Um, so that being said, uh, the guys at Seymour Duncan, of course, they've had some uh, challenges with their local, um, we'll just say, legislative branch or whatever not letting businesses run and so but i mean that even with you know proper measures taken but um that being said they've had to shutter or basically just kind of put on hold the production of a lot of pickups um to try to reach the orders that have been just avalanching in so when he's talking about suspended lists it doesn't mean that they're never going to happen again it just means that until they get caught up to a comfortable level there are going to be some models that aren't going to be immediately available. Um, yeah, now, yeah, and we are producing about like really close to twice as much as we were oh, pre-pandemic. Wow. That's insane. You know, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's just it's it's staggering, and we just we're still and we're getting there. We're catching up a little bit every month. It's it's looking a little better. Yep. Um, and we got another comment. He goes, he should have made a dirty jersey model. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that they are. They should call that the Fry Bucker, um, <laughs> oh, for the guy who made the comment, Freddie Fry. Thank you. Um, but uh, anyways, now I'll tell you, I wanted to just uh, talk to the the audience here because I brought some cool models with us, stuff that um, Seymour Duncan's the only company I know that makes such cool things. Okay, first of all, I wanted to bring. Uh, you know, just to show, and this, this is something everybody knows. This is the JB Humbucker. Okay, now I know that there's endorsement reasons why they can't call it what everybody knows it is. Okay, um, but J- for jazz blues. Yeah, yeah jazz blues. blues. You know, and nice. he he played on the Blue by Blue album, uh, playing playing a lay pool guitar. 
Um, but no, this this is the Jeff Beck. I mean, everybody knows this is a and man, amazing pickup. Really, for golly bum, for blues, rock, even metal. I mean, there's a lot of metal uh, artists oh, yeah. that just this is what they swear by. So I wanted to bring one. But one thing. Um, we deal with a lot. Of, I mean, we're in the South, okay? And uh, the F-style guitars, the bolt neck guitars are very popular. Um, and a lot of people go, man, I wish I could get that that depth and stuff with my Telecaster or with my Stratocaster. You can't. They make this. This is the JB for an F-style guitar. So it is the... It's, yeah, the JB Junior, they call it. So, and you can... Um, Boom, you have a humbucker. You don't have to reroute your pick guard. Uh, it's very simple to install. We, of course, install them at the shop every day. Um, just an amazing um, little pickup that'll pop right into a guitar. And, you know, a lot of people love doing the mods. You, you buy like an inexpensive $200 Strat copy. It's incredible what adding a, you know, less than $100 pickup into a $200 guitar will make that thing sound insane with a good setup and so on. Um, speaking of F-style guitars and also artist uh, tie-ins, um, so this is kind of a cool story. This was the um, Brad Paisley signature set called the La Brea. And for, yeah. Peop yeah, for people who don't know, okay, La Brea is a... Uh, th that's where the tar pits are in oh, Southern Brea California. Pits, yeah. yeah. Now, um, the story goes, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, please, Adi, okay, is um, Brad Paisley bought a 1968 Telecaster that was had a bunch of black, nasty uh, enamel paint all over it. He bought and, it from Chicago Music Exchange. And, and he bro so it starts with Brad Paisley, because his name's Paisley. Mm -hmm. He's looking for one of those old Paisley Telecasters. So he's looking for a Paisley Telecaster. And then Already. Did, yeah, and then he finds and the so 68 in black. He finds a 68 that's a black one, and he want and so he takes it to his guitar guy to repaint it. As Crook a Customs, guitar. I believe. I think it was Crook yeah. Customs he took it to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you could. <laughs> so that's like the, the the perfect setup for the story. Oh yeah, because, and then as I as I yeah. recall, as I said, if if I'm getting anything, so he starts to remove the paint because basically he was going to say. Um, take the finish off this thing and maybe do one of your refins in Paisley. He starts yeah. pulling the black paint off. It's a pink Paisley Telecaster. <laughs> so it's like, whoa. It's what he wanted That's really all along. Cool. And, uh, <laughs> and for, for basically the tone, though, he said was insane. So um, he got with you all, okay? Yeah. And you basically recreated the tone of those unique um or that unique telecaster and that became what is known as the la brea and so you can see the box is like half black and half paisley so kind of yeah. signify the guitar and this has really been our number one best-selling tele set mm. at the shop yeah, that's a um i mean they fly off the shelves they sound really good um now just out of curiosity i mean Okay, because here's a little personal story. Seymour Duncan himself, okay, uh, 20, let's we'll just say 20 years ago, you know, it's, actually made a set of pickups for years truly, okay? And I put him in my um, reissue Les Paul, which would have been a 99 model, okay? And they were antiquities, and it was basically when the antiquity thing just got started. And, um, but I had an original 1959 ES355 mono. And I said, I love these pickups. And he basically just said, well, here, get me, uh, I want the ohm rating measurements on them and whatever. And I'm going to recreate those pickups for you. And he did. And he sent them to me. Um, and I still have them in my Les Paul and they sound incredible. Nice. But I guess I just want to, you know, and again, how do you know? Because I know that Brad Paisley didn't send him these pickups, and you guys rip them up to apart. You know, um, so there must be some sort of process in saying, you know, well, here, give me this measurement, that measurement, and then knowing, you know, how to replicate something like that. They, they'll take they'll take the pickups out, look at them, measure them, figure out what magnets in them, and then. Just reverse engineer. I'm not exactly sure how it's done, but 
Gotcha. I know that with the Paisley that he was hanging out and he would play it. That they they would make maybe um, I think they made like five or six something like that prototypes and he plays and then hands it the guitar back. Our tech <laughs> does as fast as he can, pick up swap, <laughs> hands it back, kind of and narrows it down to to which ones they like. So it's my, a my completely it's a trial and error. Yeah, yeah, my completely uneducated. Uh, a thought on that is that Seymour's making the exact same set of pickups. He hands them to him. He's like, clearly it's number four. Four is the one I want. It's like, okay, wink, wink. We got, we got you, buddy. And it's the yeah. same pickup he's been making forever. It's, yeah. it's, it's an Al Nico three, Brad. Oh, oh right. yeah, gross. I like it a lot. Well, let me show you guys another really cool product that, um, that again, I just think I it's have so some products hip. here if you want to. Well, this right here. Oh, he's a pickup guy. Is it Alnico or Alnico? It's whatever makes you more comfortable. Oh, thank you. Well, what do you say around the <laughs> office? That's pleasant. Uh, Alnico, I guess. Alnico, either. Alnico. Okay, there it is. Yeah, I think that's. Okay. Yeah, we'll run with that. I like so, it. <laughs> so uh, Gretch was recently bought. Well, not recently, but was bought by Fender, and. When people talk about that great Gretsch sound, they're really talking about the very innovative um, Filtertron pickups that were made, innovated back in the late 1950s. And really, they were the only, you could only get Filtertrons from Gretsch. Okay. Um, now something's kind of weird happening in that Gretsch has started this very popular line uh, they call the Electromatic. Okay. And they have Filtertron looking pickups in them the, but the black tops yeah but they don't sound like the filter trons that you hear in the japanese versions of that they guitar sound, sound pretty good i'm not saying they sound bad okay we're not this isn't a good but, bad thing no. but they don't sound like the gretch pickups that you hear in a 6120 so a 5120 which is the you know 799 version of the three thousand dollars sixty one twenty? Yeah, doesn't sound the same, and it's you know in, a lot of it's in that pickups. Yeah. So now another thing that they've done though is a Filtertron is a smaller pickup. Mm. It's slightly yeah. bigger than a P ninety or a mini humbucker, but it's smaller than the um, a uh, humbucker full size humbucker. So the guys at Seymour Duncan did something brilliant. So if you guys want that great Gretsch sound, okay, that classic... Air. Yeah. Clarity. Um, they came up with what they call the Cyclone, okay, ha, ha, ha. So clone, you know, they did a phenomenal job. Now, they make this in the, the standard um, Filtertron size. So if you have, you know, like a an actual... The drop and replacement, yeah. Yeah, a drop and replacement for a Gretsch, you can do that. But more importantly, let's say you have a one of these you know, uh, electromatic models, okay, that has the full-size humbucker route, and the pickup just ain't right. You can get them now humbucker-sized. Uh, so now uh, you can get the, you know, super, the big daddy pickups in a guitar that's it's sold at a discount. So yeah. now, for a lot less money, obviously, because a set of these is a little more than 200 bucks. So, I mean, that's not expensive. It's like, it's an overdrive pedal. Cheaper than TV Jones. Oh, yeah. Well, about the same, you know, but I mean, the, uh, but a TV Jones sounds like a TV Jones and this is a Seymour Duncan. So, I mean, there is a difference. And, um, but another thing is that um, Chris Cornell, one of the best vocalists of all time, but actually a pretty sweet guitar player. Always loved Gretsch guitars back in the 90s. He was playing the Jets and stuff. Um, the last guitar he made before his untimely death was with Gibson. It was a ES335 uh, mm -hmm. and an olive drab, but he had Filtertron pickups put in it. Wow. Now, Gibson actually made special surrounds and whatnot for him, but um, with these, if you have, let's say, a dot, an Epiphone dot, or a Gibson 335 or whatever, you can buy these and plop them right in there and get that Chris Cornell kind of thing without having to spend crazy money, if you can even find one of those things. They're not easy to find. Right. Um, so this is a very cool product. And for people who haven't tried uh, Filtertron, oh my gosh, they're awesome. They really are one of my favorite pickups of all time. Yeah. And um, so this is a very cool um, product. So you guys, obviously, you listen. You use your... Your psychic powers with you know us guitar guys and Scandinavian no Scandinavian black magic exactly you know, um, 
Ron uh, chimed in. He said, would you say Chris Cornell is underappreciated? Uh, I can't say that he is because, man, Soundgarden changed the universe. I'm sorry. I mean, guys of a certain age, when Bad Motor Finger came out, it was, <laughs> it was, dude, I mean, that, yeah. that, that album defined my, like, freshman year of high school. Man, I, Chris Cornell, you know. It was know, a game-changing he, band. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and everything he touched. I mean, the guy sang a Bond uh, theme. That solo acoustic thing on uh, Stern, man. Oh, with the, the Prince tune? Doing the Zeppelin tune? Well, I, I heard him do Nothing Compares. Oh, wow, yeah. Oh, dude, it'd bring tears to your eyes. Yeah. It's insane. Yes, he's underappreciated, along with Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> no, Chris Cornell <laughs> is, no, that guy is not going anywhere. Not that um, Gilmore cat, though. But uh, anyways, okay, so I'm going to just go over a couple other cool little products just to kind of, this is another neat thing. We're not even going to get to the pickups. Oh, you, okay, Adi, if you've got some cool stuff, yeah, please, share, Ooh. you know. Uh, yeah, I could show you. Um, so we were talking about the modelers earlier. Okay. Um, how those are gaining more just stature and that a lot of more people are using it. So this is, I'd be remiss if I didn't share our power stage. Oh, yeah, those are yep. hip. So this is a little bit bigger than a boss pedal. And it's 170 watts of power, just clean power. So if you have, and it's designed just to go on a pedal board. Um, if you have um, a modeler, like one of the Axe Effects floor modelers, Camper, HX Stomp, something like that, you can plug into this, and this will power your cabinet. Your cabinet's cool. Re yeah, this is the 170. We also, I didn't have, I couldn't find a 200 line around, but we also have a 200 that has two speaker outs, a cab sim out, uh, a presence knob, just some more. Now, where are the whistles. inputs on it? I'm seeing two quarter inch outputs on the back. So this this has the, the 170. It's pretty bare bones. It's mono. Input, okay, so mono. Gotcha. Output. Do you make the, a stereo the version? The 200 has two outputs. Okay, gotcha. And this is volume, bass, middle, treble. So th this is this is a pretty cool thing. Cool. That, Does it have uh, a speaker know, emulation uh, built into it at all, or no? The 200 has a speaker emulation built in. Gotcha, gotcha. So the Which, 170 is uh, is really designed to for the processor to do the heavy lifting, and it's just pushing speakers, but the 200 adds stereo and a, a cab sim. It adds two cabs. It's not stereo. Oh, it's not? Okay. Two, two, it's like plugging your full stack in a tube. It's like running your Marshall in a tube, two cabs. Gotcha, gotcha. Single head. Uh, we do have a, a 700 rack mounted version that's way more power that is stereo and all that all that stuff and has the cab sims on it also these cool. are pretty cool so oh yeah yeah but I thought I'd share that with you and, and yeah you could run this like if you had a helix or something you could run one side with a speaker to front of house with speaker emulation to the front of house and then this for your your stage volume gotcha yeah so that's that's one. Um, here, I'll show you this thing. I have some pedals. Now, how long has Seymour is, Duncan been making pedals? Well, yeah, it's, it's fairly over new. Over ten years now. Well, it's been a while. Well, the pickup booster's been around since I started playing. So yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. Twenty-five years, but I think. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, but I remember having a pickup booster a long time ago in the nineties. Actually, mm -hmm. what what y'all's what y'all's over is the eight oh. Three or what's that? The 805. Here. 805, yeah. It's kind of yeah. your tube you guys, screamer. Let's see if that'll work. I'm trying to get. Oh, get yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Here. You guys see that okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's very blinky. Oops. <laughs> Can you still see it? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, I was talking about the LEDs, not the signal. Okay, it looks good. Yeah, so we have the 805 here. Yeah. Uh, the Diamond Head is a new, like, 80s distortion. That Vapor the Trail is awesome. Yeah, that's a phaser, crazy. And then this Vapor Trail Deluxe, we can't build anymore, but it was really cool. Hopefully, we'll be able to build some next year. Why can't you build we them? A part, oh, a part, part issue. Can, oh, gotcha. Part issue with the Bucket Brigade. Yeah. It's an analog. The Dark Sun is a delay and reverb, and then we have the this um, the Power Stage 170. Cool. Yeah, Nels Klein did a uh, show us your board or board to death, and he had some Seymour stuff on there, and he was very complimentary. He was like, you know, he, there's there's tons of boutique drives you can buy, but that 
that Seymour drive is a uh, pretty good sound, and of course it's Nels Klein too. So well, and yeah, we need to get five. Yeah, we need to get the it's, word it's, out more. It's very the... screamerish, very much so. But it has the the three band EQ instead mm-hmm. of just the single tone knob, which is. That's, so that's, that's one thing fun. about uh, you know we obviously are uh, we'll try to be big Seymour Duncan dealers you know uh, you know always have a very wide selection. I always get nervous when we're like under a hundred pickups in stock. Is that right? Yeah, I mean <laughs> I, no seriously. I mean because you think about it, they go pretty quick. Yeah. You know if you think about with humbuckers, you know there's ten models that you want to have in stock all the time, yeah, and then there's yeah. a bridge and a neck. Yeah. And so that's 20 pickups already, and then you haven't gotten into strats, you know. Um, so, no, I mean, it's, you know, they move. Um, the pedals, I don't mind saying, and I'm a bad dealer, because, <laughs> you know, we, I love pedals, and we've got the best selection of pedals in East Tennessee. I mean, I don't even think that's up for debate. Um, yeah. But we don't have a ton of the Duncan stuff, because, you know, a lot of people came in, and Seymour Duncan, they make pedals? And, yeah. we, you know, they yeah. try them and, oh, that's cool. You know, that sounds good, especially like the overdrives and stuff. But, um, you know, people are, you know, what do you want to say? They like their routines. They tube screamers and their MXR phase 90s. And, well, that's stupid you know. market, man. I would hate to be in that market right now. I've enjoyed, <laughs> I've is, enjoyed yeah, seeing it. It's, it's very a, competitive. It's a challenging, saturated market, the, but, pedal, the pedal thing for sure. It's like if, if you came out, I mean, what is SIRS? analog delay just come out at was it three hundred and sixty dollars or three hundred and eighty dollars if if you yeah. sold if you sold the vapor trail for five hundred bucks it'd probably be on mayor's board but it would but be, you don't you sell it for deluxe, yeah. you sell it affordably I, I'm really bummed that this thing this was discontinued because it's not really discontinued we're just it's up waiting in the for air parts yeah. right um it, it was 229 yeah it's too cheap like <laughs> and it has it has um, it has three buckets. Four. It has four buckets in here because it's 120 seconds a millisecond, and there's a third. There's a fourth bucket that was used just for, for one of the the mode that has very short delay, so it gets that weird chorusy kind of flangey Almost sound. Almost that pitch so shifty a, thing. Yeah. So this one was doing, and it could do all kinds of weird like. Um, weird noises with uh with with uh it could shoot the octave up shoot it down and then go into these weird repeats where it's a sequence so it, it was doing a lot of really fascinating things that not a lot of other pedals were doing or no other pedals were so. yeah i think yeah. it's solid man all right so i want to show a couple other yeah. sets that i think are just super cool okay so these are both they're they're different very different but they're also kind of share a similarity and that is a lot of what's to say modern players. I'm going to include myself as a modern player, being you know I didn't it started until the early '90s. All right. Yeah, you got stuff extending all the way up to the '70s. Oh, I mean, so I mean, but with me, it was always like oh humbuckers or single coils. So you had a Strat or you had a humbucker, and it was all the old timey guitars that had like P90s in them, and we didn't really know, you know, when we were getting rolling in the '90s, learning how to play what a P90 was all about. Um, but now that you do, it's just awesome, okay? It's an amazing sounding pickup, and I'm yeah. so happy to see that a lot of um, manufacturers are adding P90 versions. But but for all of all y'all out there who have like a standard humbucker route or a standard single coil route that didn't get the opportunity to ever try a P90, okay? So let's think of it less Paul, okay? Duncan makes a retrofit called the Fat Cat. It, oh, you got some, look at you. No, this is this is just a P90. Guitar, oh, okay. I'm so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the glare of it. The less ball. Yeah, yeah. But the fat cats, fast cats would fit into. Yeah. How so you bring my fat cat guitar. I yeah. So if you've got like a you know a Les Paul, um, doesn't matter if it's Epiphone, Gibson, whatever, or any brand really, um, just slap these in the rings and boom, you've got a P90 Les Paul that you can always go back to the standard humbuckers with. The um, so that's a super cool thing. No routing, nothing needed there. Now this is another, um, and it works great with hollow bodies too. Okay, um, including like those Gretsch models. We've actually installed quite a few of these into those Gretsch uh, Electromatics. All oh, right. Um, now this though is kind of something close to my heart. This is the P rail. Okay. Yes. The P rail is so freaking cool. Um, first of all, this is a pickup I had to bring with. This is the hot rail. Okay. Now, for people who don't know what a hot rail is, it basically has two long blade 
uh, magnets that go all the way across. So it's not pole pieces. Now the way it was explained to, to a young teenage me back in the 90s was, the hot rail is amazing because no matter where you bend your string, you will always be in the magnetic field. So there's no way, it, it just gets even um, tone no yeah. matter where you bend. So if you're a, especially a country or blues player, rock player that is doing a lot of bending, and you notice that, like when you do a double stop or something, that you kind of feel the G getting pulled away. Well, you're not going to get that with a hot rail. And they were very popular with players like Danny Gatton um, and, uh, and other people. A very copied pickup as well. Okay. Um, so with the P rail, what the P rail is, is that they've taken that kind of that fat cat idea. Okay. So you P90. And then they put a rail, a hot rail into the pickup so you truly have two very different but great sounding pickups in one where you can get that um, you can flip it to a p90 only or combine that half rail with the p90 to get like this hybrid it sounds awesome yeah, but this like, very yeah, hybrid it's, and it's cool humbucker sound. ish but it's not no humbucker. it's yeah it's yeah. it's yeah it's humbucker in name only Get your Steve Morris with, all the, with all the trash. <laughs> Humbucker in name only. I know. Um, but it, now the, you can get this in two versions. We usually like to get them with what they call the triple shot ring set. Yeah. It's, it's a little pickup yeah. ring set that has mini switches on oh, it. Yeah. So you can actually flip just the rail part off or just the P90 part on or both just from clicking a little switch on the side of the pickup. But if you have a great shop, main stage music that knows how to do this stuff you can actually assign um little mini, mini switches toggles. yeah on your guitar to, yeah. to turn that off and on but of course that involves additional drilling, drilling. and eh, that's not super fun for some people so but the the p rail set is absolutely legit um anyways i have to be respectful because i know that my friend Adi has an important meeting yeah, he's got to go to um and yeah, 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 I have to get going in a so, minute or two here. So. But anyways, um, the last thing I guess I brought with me is the custom shop stuff, and that's antiquity. Okay, yeah. and so antiquity, just correct me if I'm wrong. These were um, kind of created around the same time that the whole Fender Relic thing kind of took off. You know, so late '90s, they're recreating yeah, old yeah, guitars. Yeah. yeah, so you could use the uh, reliability, the performance of a modern Seymour Duncan pickup that you can drop in as a vintage replacement and boom, you know, you get a modern performance out of an old guitar. Or if you have a relic -y guitar, you have that kind of worn in look. And these are definitely a small batch productions. You guys don't pump these out like you do the others. Yeah, I don't want to open it. It's all, no, no. It's all and handwritten. Those, yeah, they take a lot of care into the relicking of it. And then we, there's some way that we take the magnet and degauss it so it, it's like a, a magnet that's been in a guitar 40 years old. Oh, they sound so has, amazing. Yeah, it has that, just that kind of old mojo-y tone in it. Oh, yeah. It's, well, when, yeah. you know, Seymour, because again, it was relatively new when I bought my uh, Burst, which was, it's a 59 uh, reissue Burst. It was the 40th anniversary, so 1999. And it, they, of course, had 57 classics. That's Gibson's version of whatever. Um, yeah. they, I don't know. They just, uh, they sounded, they weren't as defined as what I knew a PAF is supposed to sound like. They just kind of sound a little muddy and it's not a bad sound, but it wasn't what I was hearing from all the guitar heroes that I had. And so when Seymour offered to, uh, wind a set based on that, I was like, yeah. And a neat little secret. He had minor double cream. Ooh. Well, no, 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 because you're not supposed uh, to do that. But he says, yeah, just you're not supposed to do that. He goes, just leave the cover on. But you, know? you just told everybody. Well, okay. Well, okay. I'm sorry. He'll be mad at me now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. We, we, we aren't allowed to make double cream humbuckers. We can make P rails and uh, little humbuckers. and You can make them bright white. Yeah, but double cream is. A, so this was kind of a special thing, but uh, I love my, my pickups. They'll never be for sale. They're awesome. And um, I would have made double ivory, double toothpaste, oh. double enamel. I would have done all kinds. Of, they're not cream, no. We have double white 
and then yeah, yeah but it's, it's so silly i know it really well it's a it's a thing it, yeah but um i have to show you my guitar brad because dude that's a yamaha s2 dude that's an sg2000 and i i have to say putting gold pickups in it oh yeah really makes it it, I I am I'm ashamed that Yamaha didn't do that to begin with with the black pickups. Well, let me tell you something, man. Look, yeah. th- this is a great send off. The reason that we're doing this on Monday night instead of Tuesday is because tomorrow I will be watching Carlos Santana live oh, yeah. in Chattanooga. And for yeah, all you yeah. hardcores, before he got into the whole Paul Reed Smith thing, that guitar that Adi's got there is what Carlos played. He was actually endorsed by Yamaha and toured with those. And, yeah, um, it has this. It has this metal block under the pick guard, yeah. the, the the bridge. That I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be a sustain block or something. Dude, I mean, it the matters. It's already a neck through. Oh man, it's the same. Yeah, through. I mean, yeah, I've got a cherry red one into the shop just the other day, and uh, yeah, that's it's, that's what made me think about it. I'm yeah, like, I gotta bring mine. <laughs> no, dude, no, that thing's a work of art. But yeah, they're, but, they're so nice. But anyways, I want to thank Adi so much for um, joining us today. I mean. Again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate yeah. you. I mean, we absolutely love your product. I know people in our area do as well. And, um, and of course, you all know where to come get see more Duncan stuff and so on. But, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. But, again, thank you guys as well for watching. Be sure to share yeah. the video. Let Quick your friends story. know. Oh, yeah. Oh, story, oh, yeah. Brad. Please, please, yeah. Because you, you had uh, – because you <laughs> were emailing. You said maybe an artist story. And I, oh, I yeah. Mean, I haven't really been around long enough and with the COVID I haven't really had good artist stories but my boss who's been here for 20 years working with the company was telling me about when Eddie Van Halen visited. Oh cool. <laughs> it must have been 10 to probably maybe 15 years ago-ish okay. around the time when Wolfgang was joining Van Halen mm-hmm. where he's having his son and, and Eddie and Wolfgang came, came to Santa Barbara I think it it was at least two days. I'm not sure exactly amount of time because they were here for multiple days, and they were hanging around the custom shop and and talking to people. And Eddie would kind of playfully hassle employees, like <laughs> sit at their desk and write them notes and stuff. <laughs> nice. And my boss was so the room I'm sitting in. This is the sound room, kind of in the in the middle of the building. It's interesting how it is. Um, he said that. Eddie went into the, the sound room and was just doing dive bombs, like super loud. Like, I mean, it soundproofed, but it was still leaking out for like hours. Oh my God. Just trying out. And, and my boss said that he went downstairs and um, he was not, he wasn't like the sales manager at that point. He was just customer service or something and was trying to find an excuse so he could hang out. And like listened to <laughs> against the wall, and he got busted by his boss. Like, what are you doing? Uh, nice. <laughs> like, gotta listen to Eddie. Like, <laughs> Jetson. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. There's a lot of history here. So yeah. now, I mean, that also would have been real close. I mean, it was 15 years ago. Um, that had to be real close to the Eddie Van Halen brand. So oh, the EVH. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. It was. I'm not sure the time. It was right. Because I was talking, Derek Duncan was also talking. He said it was. He said that um, it was right when Wolfgang had joined, yeah. But it wasn't announced, and they were talking. Eddie and Wolfgang were talking to Derek and Seymour, like, "Oh yeah, you guys fought two father and son teams, kind of thing." You know. So well, no, that's that's that. interesting. So, yeah. so for all you Eddie yeah. Van Halen pickup guys, know where it started, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> the most underappreciated guitar decorator ever. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, thank you, Adi, so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, I know you got stuff to do, and uh, yeah, I gotta go pick up a kid. Oh, I I know all about yeah. that. So, but again, <laughs> uh, thank you guys for watching as well. Make sure you share the video and follow us next week. But we'll be uh, next week, same bat time, same bat channel, seven o'clock clock on Tuesdays but um, yeah you guys be safe and we'll see you next week cheers everyone Bye. see you thanks man Bye.